Okay, so I think recording has started. Um, so good morning, Derek. Uh, and thanks, Henry, for uh, setting this up as well. And you've got a number of questions, Henry, for Derek, I know. Um, I will now monitor the lobby, uh, as I say, and I'll open up the, um, the chat room uh, as well. Uh, we'll wait till about 10.30. And what usually happens, Derek, is there's a few stragglers, so we'll probably get started about 10.32, 10.33, something like that. So, um, which will be, uh, should be fine. Um, and you're in sunny Manchester at the moment, Derek, are you? Uh, yes, um, there's a little bit of blue sky looking through the window here. Not a lot, but it mm. has been sunny last last month. It is very unusual for Manchester to have a season of summer, and we have had a season um, <laughs> of sunny weather, which has been a pleasant change. Well, indeed, indeed. And I, try, I don't know if you're a cricket fan, but before we start, do you want to make any... Um, Comment regarding the uh, the, 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 the the cricket uh, Bearstow incident or not? Well, well, I have been following the Test cricket. I think um, objectively he's out, and rightly so. And the Aussies pulled a fast one, but that's the game. You play to the rules. Yeah. But if I if I put myself in Johnny Bearstow's shoes, I'd be feeling very sore about it. Yeah. Because yeah. if you think of it. From his point of view, um, he ducked a ball, the ball was caught, the ball was dead. He tapped his foot to show he thought the ball was dead, walked out of his crease, but the ball was already on the way to the wicket. It was, um, yeah. You know, Carey was smart, um, yeah. played to the rules, did a good job for Australia. But if yeah. I was best, though, I'd be feeling very hot off about very, it and yeah, feeling that was unfair. Yeah, yeah no, I get it. I get it. So, OK, well, thanks for your opinion on that. Uh, I'm going to start admitting all. <laughs> so and um, we'll. Um, morning, Chris. Morning, Adrian. Morning, Peter. Morning, JQ. Morning, Michael. If you've just joined, if you could mute, that would be good. Very, very noisy at the moment. Hang on. If you could go on mute, that would be great. Welcome, Adrian Swale from Italy. Nice for you to join at the right time. Mute a few participants. There we go. There we Michael, go. I think that was you. So good. if you just joined, if you could mute, that would be great. JQ, if you could mute as well, that'd be good. Leaving Derek and Henry to speak. That's perfect. Bring a few more people in. Okay. And good morning, Phil. Let's mute. Good morning, Ian. Morning, Peter. Good morning, Paul. I think Paul's just joined. If you've just joined, if you could mute uh, Paul, that'd be great. Uh, and Ian, um, if you could mute as well, or I don't. Yeah, thanks very much. That'll be good. Uh, there's a few other. I'll good just morning. Say, good morning. I'll just say yes, I'm very pleased to see some friends in the audience. So, oh, there uh, you are. You see, they're gonna, yes. they're gonna, they're gonna ask you some very <laughs> awkward questions, Derek. So there we go. I'm sure Peter will. Peter's waving. He's raring, he's raring to go with some very awkward questions, but no, I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, uh, Peter's on the friends list. That's fine. He's on the friends list. Yes. He's on the Christmas card list, which is great. So there we go. OK, uh, it's 10.32. Uh, I will monitor the lobby. Um, there's one more coming in. And um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of um, Pension Playpen's Coffee Morning. We're delighted that Derek Benstead is, uh, is joining us. Uh, Henry Tapper, our chairman, is going to be host and we'll be asking Derek some very nice questions regarding a um, number of uh, very uh, interesting topics that uh, we all know and love. So it'll be very interesting. And I've asked Derek to be truthful, honest and opinionated, I think, which is um, a good place to be. Uh, he's already given his opinion about the, um, the Bearstow uh, debacle, but uh, yeah, that's on the recording if you want to see it later on. So um, I'll monitor the, uh, the lobby. If you want to raise a hand and ask a question or make a point, then please raise a hand. Uh, I will also open up the chat room. Uh, and if you want to make a, a question in there or make a point, or put in a link, please do. And um, without any further ado, I will pass over to Henry Tapper and I will go on mute. So uh, Henry, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Hi, Derek. Hi, Hi everyone. Henry. Thanks for being on the call. Derek is, I expect, known to most people, so I won't spend a lot of time asking him to introduce himself. But um, if you'd just like to say a few words, Derek, about who you are and how you got to be 
on the uh, Work and Pensions Committee last week. It would be great because um, that, I think, is your most recent public appearance, isn't it? It is. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, well, let's, let's start with the who I am. Um, an actuary of long standing uh, working here in Manchester, where I always have worked. Um, I suppose, really, I should be a nobody in the industry, apart from the fact that I just seem to disagree with most things that are done in the industry, herd mentality and groupthink. Um, I'm a mathematician, a logical person, therefore one of those people who tends to speak up their opinions without caring too much about what people think of them. Um, and uh, I guess that's built me a little bit of a reputation down the years. Um, so how did I get to the Work and Pensions Committee? Well, at first actuarial, um, you know, whenever there's a pension consultation on, um, most of them will send an, a response to. If I've got an opinion, I will want my response to be, I will want my opinion to be in the first actuarial response. Best way to achieve that is to be first drafter. So although it's not formally my role to write first actuarial consultation responses, um, if it's not a massive one like the funding code one, I'll generally try to be first in uh, with a draft for everybody else to critique. Uh, so um, when the Work and Pensions Committee opened its DB inquiry, put out nine or so questions for people to answer. Um, I had first go at answering those. Um, Hilary Salt, my boss, and my name were on the response sent to WPC. And uh, so, so when WPC held its evidence sessions or started its, ev its evidence sessions, uh, it chose its panel of experts, um, ran an hour with a particular focus on open pension schemes. And um, I guess on the toss of a coin, they picked me rather than Hillary uh, to, to uh, go to Westminster and talk to them face to face. And how did you find it? Um, well, it's always nice to be asked an opinion. I always like to give an opinion. Um, it's good to engage with MPs who are interested and have some background in the issue. Um, you know, I could have hoped maybe for slightly more focused questions, uh, but but generally speaking, I do find if you if you read a report from a parliamentary committee, be it the recent report on LDI, for example, or indeed the one from the House of Lords that reviewed the RPI CPI debate. You do get intelligent reports out of the system. So even if the questions didn't seem um, as focused as they might be, they gave me a chance to express some opinions, said most of what I wanted to say, uh, and uh, hopefully the committee will get something out of it and they'll form a decent report in due course. Do you think that these sessions do much good? Yes, I'm, I'm, I am I am going to say yes to that. Um, the political process takes time. Um, so, so working at first actuarial with Hillary, um, who many people on the call will know as a politically minded person and uh, you know, working with trade unions um, as as we do in first touch rail manchester office you get some exposure to the political process it, it takes time for reels to turn for people to form opinions to to um get a view lobby for it influence government get some legislation done but you know, in in the world of pensions, particularly, you know, there's there's been an abundance of legislation down the years. You might even say too too much sometimes, but there's there's been some good legislation on pensions in recent years. You know, Royal Mail and CDC, very good case in point. Auto enrolment, great case in point. PPF back in 2005, best thing that ever happened in the DV pensions world. Um, so. 
good things happen. It may take time. It's not as simple as a politician asks an expert a question and just because they've heard me, they go and write, and write some new laws new, and some new regulations. But that things do happen eventually if you keep pressing good ideas. Uh, well, one of the good things that seems to have happened is that, as if by magic, a lot of our um, so-called derelict DB pension schemes have moved back into surplus. Um, you sort of like, I know you at first actually have been running an index which has said that they've effectively been running a surplus for some years. But would you like to comment on the current sort of almost irrational exuberance of the pensions industry <laughs> about this newfound solvency they discovered? Well, um, this is this is all part of the industry group think. Um, so, so since 2005, since statutory funding started with the regulation that says um, discount rates can either be based on the yield on high quality bonds or on the expected return on assets and future contributions, uh, most of the industry has herded around adding something to the gilt yield to form their discount rate. If you look in TPR's reports on funding, which it publishes annually, the average discount rate in a pension scheme for SFO purposes has been gilt yield plus 1% or very close to it continuously since 2005. Uh, so, so actuaries, the industry, pensions regulator case managers are using an actuarial method um, that does not relate well to the value of assets that produces volatile answers, that produces answers that are not terribly meaningful to the extent that a scheme is not invested in gilts. And, and so as gilt yields have fallen, um, discount rates averaging at gilts plus 1% have fallen to the point that um, you know, pension schemes were getting to the point in 2020, 2021 of um, of uh, of uh, of uh, of um, doing actuarial evaluations using negative real discount rates, their discount rate assumption potentially lower than the inflation assumption, which is just an absurdity that we, um, in a funded pension scheme, assume that we're going to pay out less money on benefits than we pay in in contributions because we're discounting at negative real interest rates. Uh, so. Gilt yields have started increasing again, increased quite rapidly during 2022. And so everybody using a gilt yield driven discount rate suddenly thinks, oh, there's a big surplus. But the benefits haven't changed. You've just changed from using an absurdly low discount rate to, to, to a discount rate that's a bit more sensible, more by fluke than by intention. Um, you know, if, if instead, we had always set discount rates by looking at the expected return on the assets the scheme actually holds and then making a prudent assessment of the expected return, i.e. best estimate minus rather than gilts plus, you can end up with a more stable valuation result that gives you a more stable basis of planning. Um, you know, we've observed um, unstable valuation results down the years because of a method uh, which is common, um, that just doesn't give stable results, and it's it's unnecessary. Other choices are available. So, having worked on best estimate basis in your FABI index, which has been published now for several years, do people at first actuarial feel vindicated? Uh, or do they just feel frustrated? Um, well, people at first actuarial are individuals who debate with each other and and individually do their own thing. So one of the distinctive things about first actuarial is that although we prepare a house for you to guide our actuaries, we don't compel our actuaries to follow it. Um, so. So within consultants at First Actuarial, there are people following the Gilts Plus theme, just because I say it's no good doesn't mean that they 
stop following the guilt trustee. Maybe it's the appropriate thing for their client. Maybe their professional trustee expects it, that kind of thing. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, I do have a colleague on the on the day that the uh, the LDI crisis was really, really hitting and the markets were crashing and the Bank of England had intervened in the guilt market. Um, I, I do have a colleague who just posted up a Teams message to say, did Derek come to work today riding on a right charger with a train of people bowing down because mm-hmm. it always said LDI was rubbish and you know shouldn't shouldn't um, be in it and he's been vindicated. But uh, um, <laughs> you know that well, vindication is no comfort to those clients who have LDI. Um, those clients who don't have LDI, they're the ones with the much better funding levels because they haven't crashed their asset values and and yes. Pension schemes on average might be better funded, but um, in that universe, they're divided between those who haven't made a thumping loss on LDI and those who avoided a thumping loss on LDI. So, you know, uh, so so potentially those who've made the big losses haven't really seen necessarily a big change in their funding level. It's the ones that didn't have LDI that have seen the improvement. Really interesting. Are you finding that there is a change of mood among your clients and are they actually looking to do things differently since the so-called improvement in funding has occurred? Um, Well the short answer to that is no. Um, Obviously when a large proportion of the industry has adopted LDI as its preferred route they're not going to say oh that was a bad idea after the gut market has fallen, rather they'll just promote the reasons why it's a good idea in their opinion to have done what they've done and defend the outcome. Um, so the industry is full of people defending the LDI outcome and therefore not changing track. Um, yes, there are closed schemes, schemes that have already closed to accrual if they've, you know, who are finding that maybe a buyout is more affordable now um, or uh, many clients who share an LGPS, a, a, a private employer in LGPS, maybe it's more affordable to leave LGPS now. Um, so, so yes, there's a there's a move there that people who are in a situation where they are um, determined to leave a defined benefit pension scheme um, or to wind it up find it more possible now than they did. A few months ago. And what do you find uh, is the capacity for them to actually uh, leave um, LGPS? Is LGPS making it easy and are uh, their buyout quotes on the table for your clients? Uh, and that's an interesting question, Henry. Um, so there are over 80 different regional LGPSs all under separate management. Um, each setting their own policy for cessation of an employer. Um, Most, but not all, LGPSs in recent years have used a guilt yield to define their cessation basis to set the terms on which an employer can leave the LGPS and pay their final uh, contribution determined on a guilt yield basis. Um, What we are seeing now that a guilt yield basis is affordable, um, for employers to leave LGPS, uh, we're seeing some LGPSs set a cessation basis using a discount rate lower than a guilt yield. Um, in some cases, substantially lower than a guilt yield. So, so think about what guilt yield was a year or so ago, a couple of percent or so. Notwithstanding guilt yields now is four percent or four and a half percent, they're still using a two percent or two and a half percent discount rate for cessation. Um, I struggle to think of a polite professional word to describe that behaviour. I think it's an outrage. They're caught in a trap and they can't turn back. Right. (laughs) But on the buyout side, First Actuary are known for having relatively small schemes in terms of assets. Are you finding that you can get quotes or is it hard? Um, I'm not really the person to ask. Um, I haven't had personally on my portfolio 
um, haven't had to manage a client in wind up um, in in recent years. Um, therefore, anything I say is sort of second hand from a training session about how it's going in the marketplace. Not necessarily terribly valuable, but generally speaking, yes, harder for a smaller scheme to um, get a quote. Um, maybe only two insurers who are terribly interested in small schemes. Um, important to have clean data and a fully funded scheme on buyout or otherwise provable assets at the employer just to prove to an insurer that you're serious. So, so if you're going to go to the market with a small scheme, clean data, assets ready, prove that you're serious and then you might be able to take it forward. Um, so, so just because a scheme has suddenly found itself fully funded on a buyout basis and the employer suddenly thinks, hey, let's wind this up, doesn't mean that you're ready to go to market if you've still got your GMP equalization to do, for example, do your data audit. You've got a lot of work to do before you get to market. Moving on, yeah. Have you noticed a change in attitude from the pension regulator, in particular with regard to their sort of proposals for the DB funding code? Too soon to say. Um, I th the introduction of the code has been put back to April 24. Um, the telling thing will be, are there any material changes in whatever is brought forward for April 24? So the key thing, the single key thing, is this date of significant maturity. So we're looking at low dependency funding um, at a relevant date, a date of significant maturity that the pensions regulator is suggesting when the scheme has a duration of liabilities of 12 years. But that duration calculation varies with the discount rate. Um, a scheme of mine that had 15 years duration on its valuation date of 1st January 21, um, already, no, 1st January 22, sorry, um, within the year had a duration of 12 after the guilt yield rise. So I could have told that client, your significant maturity date comes in 2032, which it did on 1st January 22, but in September 22, it was last week. Um, so, so the the regulator's definition of significant maturity doesn't work. Um, I expect many people in the industry told it so. Um, I was disappointed that it consulted on a code that clearly didn't work. Um, so we'll have to see if there's any any movement um, between now and April 24. But in your day-to-day -day dealings with TPR caseworkers, do you? find that there's any difference or is it very much as if you were still talking to them two years ago? The latter. Um, well, I I don't speak to caseworkers all that often because I'm dealing with small enough schemes to be below TPR's radar. Um, I would draw a distinction between the mood music that's transmitted by the people at the top of TPR and what you read in TPR caseworker letters. So case managers at TPR, typically speaking, not actuaries, not expert in investment. Nevertheless, they write to you half a dozen page letters that are full of um, TPR recommendations, shall we say, about what to do on funding and investment. But the author of the letter isn't an expert in those things. Um, so, so it, it, I, I don't attach a lot of credibility to a TPR case manager letter. It just tends to trot out um, a list of known TPR preferences. Doesn't matter how many bonds you have, the recommendation is to buy more. Doesn't matter how much LDI <laughs> you have, the recommendation is to have more. If you have active members, let's have fewer of them on lower accrual or terminate accrual. It is it's all standard stuff. It doesn't matter what you're doing, push for something more cautious from the point of view of what TPR thinks is more cautious. So um TPR does what it does 
to meet its own statutory objectives. Pension trustees do not have the same objectives as TPR. You should expect that pension trustees reach different decisions about the same matters um, to the decisions that TPR reaches because they have different objectives. And so I I'm never very comfortable with trustees defending themselves in a negotiation with an employer saying things like, oh, we can't do that. TPR wouldn't like it. Well, a diligent trustee should be thinking hard about whether TPR's preference is a function of TPR statutory objectives, which the trustees don't have to pay attention to, and whether the best thing for the scheme is different from what TPR suggests. And then if it is if the best thing for the scheme is different from TPR's suggestion, then we'll think hard about being bold enough to do something different. Really interesting point of view. Can I move on now to something which I think is, is becoming increasingly uh, prominent in conversations, and that's this question of surplus. Um, notional or otherwise, people have it in their heads, they are in surplus, and they're now asking questions about what they should do about that surplus. You might have seen Towers Watson coming up with some proposals yesterday. Yeah. Um, where your scheme is closed, where, what's your position on where the surplus goes, who owns it, what, uh, and, and what you should be advising your clients to say, to do, rather than say? Um, that's, that's a very context specific question. So um, who owns it? Ask a lawyer to read the scheme rules and see what the scheme, scheme rules say. Um, what's the benefit design of the scheme? If there's no increases on pre-97 pension, then there's an obvious place to make a benefit improvement to spend surplus or to make a discretionary spend on a pension increase. Um, every every scheme is a context. If an employer has been bullied into paying massive contributions in recent years, an employer is likely to think, well, all those contributions you made me pay for the last five years have been overpaid. That surplus is mine. They're the contributions that I put in. Um, so I'd hesitate to give a general answer to that question, but to but to just say that's a that's a that's a context specific question. It's an it depends, and I yeah. don't blame you for saying it's an it's, it depends. Um, Con, you've got your hand up. Do you want to take yourself off mute before you ask? Sorry, oh, using a new browser, couldn't find my unmute. Um, I'd, I'd actually just like to take a, a step back. Um, I think the your point, Derek, about statutory objectives for the PTPR uh, not necessarily being something that should be of concern to uh, pension schemes themselves is a very important one and really deserves a lot more emphasis than it's been given. Um, the, the, the specific question I have concerns casework of recommendations and so on. And one of the things you said in the course of um, your listings of their typical recommendations was a recommendation to terminate the cruel. Um, have you actually seen caseworker notes which recommended the termination of a cruel? Well, TPR will always say we don't tell people what to do, we make suggestions. No, I, no, no, no. I feel it has, it pretty certain. Their notes. We all know I, their box line. I feel pretty certain that amongst the open schemes we advise in Manchester, Office of First Actuarial, we could find TPR letters discouraging future accrual. Okay, that's good enough. Thank you, Thank Eric. You. Back to the matter in hand. Um, you've got surpluses. You've you've got more confident employers. Are you seeing any employers looking at either opening their scheme for future accrual again or considering some form of uh, risk sharing, specifically CDC? 
Okay, well, let's, yeah, there's two, actually two separate questions there because yeah. um, Collective DC legally is separate from DB. Um, so if you literally went CDC, you're starting a new pension scheme. Um, so I think I'm gonna take a, take a giant leap and just start answering that question by starting with the point that in in the private sector, there's very little pension provision. So if I use the word pension, I mean an income for life. I don't mean an investment savings account um, to spend on your retirement. Um, so individual DC is only a pension if you buy an annuity with it on your retirement. Um, so in in DB pensions in the private sector, we used to have about 6 million active members and we've now got less than 1 million. Um, so DB pension provision is nearly gone. But the people's need for pensions, the people's need for security in retirement hasn't gone. That DB pensions in the UK is largely a past service issue and not available for future service, means that the need for employees to save for retirement in the private sector in a pension scheme is not being met. So, so if I start your question, start answering your question by saying, in the pensions industry, those of us who think we're pensions experts should be using our expertise to show how to provide pensions in bulk, cost efficiently um, to the private sector. So Collective DC is the new way of doing that, where we provide a pension without any guarantee and therefore easy for an employer to commit to if all they have to do is pay a fixed contribution. Um, if we wind back, getting nearer to your question, um, in, in defined benefit world, we could have benefit designs that greatly increase the proportion of discretionary benefits or non-guaranteed benefits. So in a career average scheme, there is no obligation to revalue a career average benefit before retirement in law. That can be an entirely discretionary thing, provided deferred members and active members get the same rate of revaluation. So the guaranteed revaluation can be nil and the increases can be entirely discretionary. And then you can use uh, discretionary increases to control funding in your career average scheme. Um, so, so beginning to get to your question about spending of surplus and what do you do with DB schemes and do you reopen them? Well, however unlikely that it might be to reopen a pension scheme to active members or to add some active members to the remaining handful in a close new entrance scheme, that should be on the agenda because there's a big agenda of unavailability of pensions in the private sector, which needs to be addressed. And whether it's addressed through CDC or flexible DB or, or through using well-funded DB schemes to support the addition of active members again in a scheme that hasn't had any active members for the last 10 or 15 years, this has been closed to new entrants. Those things are made more possible by having a well-funded DB scheme. It isn't difficult to have a well-funded DB scheme that is open to accrual and to still maintain that good funding. If you invest for a decent return, then, then the funding surplus in, in, in the scheme to some extent is self-perpetuating. Once you've got to that point, you can keep that point even while paying um, a modest contribution to future service. They calculate it on a best estimate basis, for example. Um, contributions to future service don't have to be high if you already have high funding for past service. Um, so, you know, people in, in industry talk about, well, a low contribution to future service dilutes funding for past service. No, not necessarily if you've already got a funding surplus and if you're still invested in assets that earn a decent return. Um, you can perpetuate that prudent funding position. Um, prudent funding is a past service issue, not a future service issue. So the, the maths of open pension schemes is 
insufficiently understood in the in industry these days. Not enough people have worked on open schemes enough of the time um, to realise how easy it is to manage a well-funded open pension scheme. They've got so wrapped up in the difficulties of running closed pension schemes, which are harder to manage than open schemes. I have been taught by you on this using your sweet spot uh, in the past, and I'm very grateful. I think anyone who's um, been involved in the CDC discussions knows that your history with CDC goes back way beyond 2017 and the Royal Mail introduction. Do you want to just give us a little bit of background as to how you developed your thinking and, and and then talk a little bit about how the Royal Mail pension scheme came to be, because I think there's a, a lot of myth about uh, this being a hugely planned thing. Um, my understanding is um, that it really was very opportunistic on behalf of a few individuals who got together and sorted the problem out in a, in a closed room, really. It was an ACAS situation, wasn't it? So, sorry, first yes. question, how, okay, what's your well, background? And then yeah. second, how did the Royal Mail scheme come to be? Well, let's let's uh, tell a chronological tale. Um, so my personal tale on CDC begins in 1997. So we've got new Labour government, open to stakeholder pension consultation, um, issues a very long list of questions in that consultation most of which are extraordinarily naive and show very little understanding of the pension industry, but nevertheless has as its heart an objective of um, uh, mass production of pensions um, that people can join safely and save for their retirement. So um, back then I was a fairly newly qualified actuary. I wrote a paper something like 60 pages long um, responding to the stakeholder pension inquiry that uh, proposed a national collective DC scheme that anyone can join, including the self-employed, um, that would, you know, on 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 payment of any contribution from a member, convert it into CDC pension. Um, no guarantees attached to that because it's a national scheme. Um, it's not an employer backed scheme necessarily, can take the self employed in it, maybe self employed are putting in large lump sums, you know, doing the conversions on market terms. Work this all out as to how you could do that. Um, Sent it into the DWP, didn't hear a dicky bird. Um, but that was when I first started thinking about collective DC. The fundamental point being what if, what if a pension can go down as well as up? That's the basic question. Um, so you take away that basic guarantee of defined benefit pensions. If there's no guarantee, anyone can join the scheme, including the self-employed. So that was where I started and first started thinking about it. Um, my next step along the way was helping a final salary scheme become career average with discretionary revaluation. And there's somebody on this call who's connected to that scheme, a trustee of that scheme, um, who I've worked with for many years on and off on pensions issues. So there we had a had, had an employer in a service industry, um, not a large volume of assets, not well placed um, from an employer covenant point of view for asset backing for a pension scheme, but working in a field where they wanted and needed to continue to provide proper pensions for their staff um, as part of their reward package to to attract staff in an area where they, as an employer, couldn't necessarily pay the best salaries. So, so we made that scheme conversion in 2003 to career average with entirely discretionary revaluation. Um, that scheme is still open to new entrants. Um, I haven't personally been the scheme actually to it since I joined First Actuarial in 2009. Um, um, there's some history to how well the scheme has coped since then, but let's just say it's open. And that's the fundamental thing, that, that to protect people's retirements, the first thing you need is an open pension scheme that, that they can join. If there's risk attached to that pension when they have it, then so be it. There's less risk in having a pension with risk than there is in having no pension. So, so let's move forward. Um, so Sir Steve Webb 
introduced his defined ambition pension idea in the pension schemes act 2015 i have no idea who was talking to steve to bring forward that idea um i wasn't a party to its introduction but i i did attend a work and pensions committee evidence session debating the bill um, as it was going through parliament um but let's let's move on from there to the royal mail situation so so i'm the pension consultant for communication workers union um royal mail um since its privatization um great difficulty managing its its uh, defined benefit pension scheme royal mail as an organization has 140,000 employees, most of whom are the people who put letters through your door. Uh, so it's a labour intensive business, um, proportionately speaking, low assets per employee, not a good candidate for providing defined benefit pensions in the modern risk averse era. So Royal Mail opened a consultation with the unions um, on closing their defined benefit scheme to accrual and the existing individual DC scheme, which already existed for new entrants, making that the universal universal provision for all staff. So the Communication Workers Union came to us and uh, you know, it gave us the challenge of you're the experts in the pensions industry, Hillary and Derek. How can the Royal Mail provide pensions? We don't want investment accounts, we want pensions. We want dignity in retirement for our postal workers so that when they retire they get a wage in retirement you know that's the phrase that that the CWU used um that that their pension expectations when they retire maintain their workers standard of living in retirement that they had while they were in work um so so we spent a few months working with the CWU um to say well first of all Royal Mail cannot sensibly provide a defined benefit scheme given its covenant. So, so the answer is not a fully guaranteed defined benefit pension. What we need to do is to lower that guarantee. And if we lower the guarantee, the trustees of the Royal Mail scheme might feel more able to invest in growth assets, make the pensions more affordable. You know, the Royal Mail trustees have got the point of asking 55% employer contribution. Um, obviously, the employer or male couldn't afford to pay that. Um, so to make pensions more affordable, we need a rewarding investment. So how can we design a scheme um, to make risk averse pension trustees feel able to invest rewardingly? We need to lower the uh, guarantee and have a um, discretionary benefit improvement plan as a lever of funding control. So coming back to the scheme um, I redesigned in 2003, that was the heart of what we proposed to the CWU. Um, when we convinced the CWU that was a good idea, we took it to the negotiating table with the Royal Mail. So I very much remember the first meeting um, between the union and the Royal Mail. Um, long rectangular table, very much traditional Royal Mail managers and advisors on one side, union and advisors on the other side. You can you can imagine the scene. Uh, so the Royal Mail managers go first um, to outline their proposal to close DB and um, go universal individual DC. They give their speech. They sit back and wait for the union response. And uh, nobody was wearing a hard hat and a protective vest. But, you know, metaphorically, you could you could see them on their side of the table sort of waiting, waiting for the response. And um, the look of, you know, or an almost literal jaw dropping on the side of the Royal Mail when the union said, um, we agree that you can't do fully defined benefit at 55% contribution and low investment risk assets, that's just not workable. Um, here's an idea that we do think is workable. And we and we tabled the flexible defined benefit idea, career average for discretionary increases. Um, so, so obviously that idea didn't fly. Um, you know, um, that idea has roughly by value 
half the benefit by value is guaranteed, half is in lies in the discretionary increases. Um, Royal Mail, to their credit, went away and worked with the idea for several months um, and you know, formed an opinion that the Royal Mail Covenant wasn't up to it, that the um, accounting presentation of a flexible defined benefit scheme would cause the Royal Mail problems. Um, I feel that could have been pushed a bit harder, but it wasn't. Um, but the day came when in a meeting that I wasn't at, because it was a meeting that Hillary was at and not me, somebody tabled Collective DC. Um, and Hillary came back from that meeting and said, hey, Derek, we're talking about Collective DC at the Royal Mail. What do you think? Well, I said, well, you know, it's not legal. We've got the Pension Schemes Act 2015, but the regulations were never written. But if Royal Mail think they have the political clout to take that idea to government and get the regulations written for Pension Schemes Act 2015, then let's do it. Um, so, so Royal Mail and Communication Workers Union jointly approach government and DWP, start talking about CDC. One of the first things the DWP decided was, well, rather than use the defined ambition legislation, which defines pension schemes three ways between DB, money purchase, and this third thing called defined ambition, We'll start again with the primary legislation, um, make CDC part of the money purchase arena, um, which is which is what they've done. And um, funnily enough, I turned up in my desk drawer a document I've written in 2014 to the to find ambition pension schemes bill consultation, in which I've written in that 2014 consultation response. You don't need the to find ambition as a third I, I, I idea, CDC as, as a subset of, of a money purchase, that is what you should do. And that is indeed what they did in the pension schemes at 2021. Um, so um, it's a fine tale of parties working together, sharing good ideas and getting something done, be that between the union and the employer or between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in Parliament. A good idea has been shared, adopted, and is on the verge of implemented. Um, I only wish in the pensions industry that there was a much greater track record of people listening to good ideas and implementing them. The Royal Mail is the big one. Um, however, how many more negotiations do I have helping clients, be they trustees or employers, hold negotiations where people just don't listen to each other. I wish it happened more, um, but it happened big time between Communication Workers Union and Royal Mail, and it, is, it, it has got us to a good place. OK, well, I, I am now going to ask uh, to listen to Chris Burford, um, who's got a comment, I think, to make or a question to ask. Over to you, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Amy, and then thanks, Eric, again. Yeah. As you know, I'm a massive fan of the CDC design, and you, you've mentioned it a couple of times, the the sort of interaction between the loss of the guarantee and the much better kind of results that come from that. When you talk to people, kind of, if you ask them, do you want a guarantee? They just say yes, <laughs> and don't ask how much that guarantee has cost. Um, and, and, you know, we know from the sort of CDC the sort of uh, design, a sort of investigation and modelling that it's sort of potentially forty percent or more or higher that that sort of output. Have you found a good way, and then and sort of what ways have you found to sort of express that the the loss of the guarantee isn't necessarily such a bad thing? It, it can lead to such so much <laughs> sort of better outcomes effectively um, to to the people you discuss. Um. I suppose there's two ways I could take that question about whether it's a discussion I'm having with employers thinking about CDC or a discussion I'm having with CDC members as to how they should view CDC. Um, obviously, in the latter case, we haven't got our first CDC scheme yet, and therefore um, no experience yet of communicating CDC with, with individual people. Um, so if I sort of take that aspect of it first, then um, what I expect to see is a, you know, it's a career average benefit statement, basically. 
um, you, know, you can show on the benefit statement last year's pension, uh, this year's increase on that pension or indeed decrease in bad times, this year's benefit accrual, add those three things up and you've got this year's pension after a year's benefit accrual. Um, so the key thing to my mind is that annual increase or decrease on the accrued pension, that, that every year you issue that statement, you'll be issuing a message to the members, hey, we've had a good year, this year we're given CPI plus 1%, or hey, we've not had such a good year, this year you've got CPI, or the year after that, hey, we've had a bad year, this year you've got CPI minus 1%. Members will see over time that nothing is certain in, in CDC. Uh, so there'll be a constant small change every, 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 every year. But hopefully the picture that will be developed over a number of years is, is um, here's a benefit. It's not guaranteed. Sometimes it proves quite quickly. Sometimes it improves slowly or doesn't improve at all. But there's a picture that develops of uncertainty, but nevertheless something that is working. Um, a pension that is growing most of the time. Um, the other angle of talking about CDC and its risks um, with employers or indeed with potential trustees. So um, employers are keen on certainty of contributions. So this is one of the reasons for um, DWP writing fresh priming legislation to make CDC part of money purchase in legal terms so that there's no possibility of creating a contribution promise somewhere in collective DC or sorry a, a, a benefit promise in collective DC that's not intended. Um, it's maybe trustees who get hung up on investment risk. Um, so, so the idea in talking about it is say, well, there is no benefit guarantee. Therefore, the concept of investing to meet that guarantee disappears. The concept that you are left with is investing for a good return. And that's a concept that we're all used to in, in individual DC space. Any, any of us on this call, if we're asking the, ourselves a question, how should somebody who's saving for retirement, who's still working, invest their DC pension scheme? You know, Nine out of 10 of us or 19 out of 20 would be saying go for growth, put it in equities, maybe a bit of commercial property, but you in, you invest for growth because that's the long run best thing to do. Um, in collective DC, it's the same answer, but even more so because you, you don't have individuals um, you know, in individual DC world, you're either accumulating or you're in retirement, you either have a growth strategy while you're saving or you've got your spending strategy in retirement with a nasty risk on the day that you retire, switching from one strategy to the other or around the time that you retire. Collective DC gets rid of that individualised risk because you invest the scheme as a whole. And the scheme as a whole is either growing or holding its size or shrinking. Um, it is offsetting because it's collectivised contributions from benefit payments and reducing the trading in assets, you can have buy and hold investment strategy in a collectively invested pension scheme. Um, so, so I think it's, it's about persuading trustees and investment consultants that without a benefit guarantee, the world has changed. Put your individual DC goggles on, not your DB goggles on, and perceive that the collective DC scheme should invest for growth. Can I ask you whether you concur with views commonly held, including views held by me, that actually CDC could work on a decumulation only basis? It certainly can. It's the hardest thing to do. Um, and we need commitment from a provider. You'd be competing with the annuity market. You'd want to individually underwrite to give enhanced decumulation CDC pensions for those of shorter life expectancy. And, and you have a shorter period of um, managing the benefits. It's just between retirement and the death of you and your partner if you have a partner's pension as well. 
um, maybe a period of 25 years or 30 years for a couple, as opposed to managing a pension over a period of 70 years for somebody who joined on recruitment at 21 and lived until they're 91. Um, so it's actually more difficult, um, but certainly possible. Um, if it was exclusively decumulation only CDC scheme, the benefit fluctuations from year to year would be greater because you're spreading variation over a shorter period of time. Um, but certainly in the realms of the possible. Pragmatically, do you expect to see many DC schemes switch to CDC other than on a decumulation only basis? Do you expect many DB schemes to adopt CDC as an alternative to DB accrual? What, what's the likely direction of travel for CDC beyond Royal Mail? Um, three different aspects to that answer. Um, I don't see many more Royal Mail single employer schemes. The entry barrier to CDC is high. So if you want to start a, if you want to start a, a DB scheme, it's very, very easy. Get a lawyer to write a trust deed notify HMRC to register the scheme, off you go. It's the reason why pension scams exist, because it's easy to do. Um, CDC, to start a CDC scheme is hard to do. Um, very large entry barrier to put together your file for pension regulator approval to authorise your scheme. Don't see many single employers having the energy and the funds to do that. Um, you know, I have a client employs about 2,000 people, determined to start CDC soon, but looking at the single employer regs, because they're in the housing industry, we're thinking first about multi-employer scheme for the housing industry, get several other employers on, on, on board, do it together. So, so where next for CDC? I think industry-wide schemes in those sectors that are used to industry-wide schemes, social housing is a very obvious example, but it only needs one provider to start CDC that's multi-employer that any employer can join. We need to get to the point that joining CDC is as easy for the employer as joining individual DC. You pick your master trust and you join it, you pay the contribution, you don't necessarily have any other engagement. Um, I think we're likely to start that with an industry-wide scheme and then the provider, the industry-wide scheme, all they have to do is say, hey, why do this only for the housing industry? Let's do it for independent schools. And having done it for independent schools, let's do it for anybody. So, so there is a very obvious um, place for um, CDC to be multi-employer for whole career plus retirement to start up, I hope, quite, quite quickly. Um, Decumulation only CDC, that's harder work. Um, you're going to need a dedicated provider to put up the capital and the time and the money to start such a scheme and wait for it to become profitable. It's one thing to get half a dozen employers together to fund the start of other schemes. Another thing for a provider to start decumulation on their own at their own expense and develop it to become profitable. So I, I, I think that will take longer. Really interesting. There's a hand up from Peter. Do you want to ask your question, Peter? Go, Sorry, yeah, I actually raised, lowered my hand. I was just going, when we're <laughs> talking about um, uh, uh, decumulation CDC, I was going, going to ask about multi-employer CDC schemes and um, which Derek then covered. Um, but um, I'm a little bit concerned about CDC, uh, the initial being raw mail as a company, because as I understand it, the benefit of the CDC scheme is the continuing input of new employees and contributions um, being available. And if you're dependent on a single employer, you have that employer's risk into the mix. And uh, uh, yes, I, that was really the point I was going to make. So thank you. That's a that's a very fair point, Peter. Um, you know, I have been, yeah, pressing anybody who will listen at the at the, at the at the DWP just how important it is that we have a have a CDC scheme 
open to any employer um, or indeed a group of employees without an employer if an employer has gone bust um, so that you can wind up a CDC scheme by bot transfer to another CDC scheme. Um, the last thing you want to be doing is disaggregating CDC into individual pots because the one employer has gone bust and there's no other CDC scheme to take a bot transfer. Uh, that's an important thing to get off the ground as soon as possible. Uh, Dennis, um, I'm, would you like to unmute yourself? I'm, I'm glad you're asking the question because it may be about a scheme which Derek is familiar with as well. <laughs> oh, that, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Sorry, it, well, it, the, my question isn't about this scheme, actually. Um, no. My question is... I'm uh, grateful. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a not, uh, 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 someone who's who, who's not in, in the industry. Um, I'd like to ask a very, what seems to me a very naive question, but it, it's, it's a burning question that um, I keep worrying about. Why can you not have both a guarantee and a variable um, income. I'm thinking now of the with prudential with profits, uh, uh, sorry, the, the prudential uh, income choice annuity, which I, I'm familiar with, which offers both um, a variable income dependent on the performance of the with profits fund and also a secure level, a guaranteed level. I mean, if the Prudential are doing that, why is it not possible to provide that as as part of the uh, the CDC idea? Uh, because in law, um, insurance company legislation is one thing. Occupational pension scheme legislation um, divided into defined benefit world and individual and uh, DC world are two further things. Uh, so um, in in DB world, if we're talking about pensions with a guarantee, then um, you can have variable increases provided they're upwards only. So it's the it's the legal system that excludes the possibility of a benefit reduction in defined benefit world. So um, in defined benefit world, you could do something that looked a bit like your potential with profit pension, um, but it would be the upwards only variable benefits in that DB scheme. Um, a potential with profit pension possibly can go down if you, um, depending on the terms in which you started it. Um, but insurance companies operate in the different legislation entirely to occupational pension scheme legislation. So there's different possibilities and different exclusions depending on which legislative field that you're operating in. We're getting to the end now of our yeah, session. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Dennis, carry on. No, is that, I was just going to say, well, you're talking about changing the law to allow CDC. So yes. Yes. So, uh, so the fundamental difference between CDC and DB is in a, a CDC yeah. collected pension, the pension can go down and in DB it can't. Yeah. So so that's the basic distinction. <laughs> if a DB pension could go down, it would cease to be a DB pension in the eyes of the law. Um, so. OK. Yeah. I, right. I'm, I'm You're getting back to Steve to... Webb's defined ambition idea, I think. I'm not going to curtail discussion. If there are any further questions and you urgently want to ask one, please ask one now. O on that basis, it being 10.32 and we've been on the go for an hour and you've all got better things to do, including Derek, who's got to do some chargeable time. Uh, I'd like to thank him very much for giving up an hour, uh, which presumably mean an extra hour tonight, Derek. And uh, if we can all give them a sort of a virtual thank you uh, in terms of such a clear explanation. Loads of questions I'd like to have asked, but we just simply haven't got any time. Have you got anything to say for yourself beyond what we've said, Derek? Um, let's do it again in six months. <laughs> Yeah. There's, that's a, there's still a, that, that, you know, that's a date. That's a date. Yep. Yeah, there's still a million things on your question list, but one or two things you didn't ask, one or two things we could have explored a bit more. So um, if you'll have me back as a 
appropriate time, let's do it again. Excellent yeah, stuff. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Derek. Thanks everyone for being with us. Steve, do you just want to do the housekeeping at the end? Yeah, just to say thank you very much for, for attending. Uh, thanks to Derek. Thanks to Henry for, for your input and your time. Uh, next week, we have got Sir Steve Webb, uh, funnily enough, uh, talking about uh, pensions and the gender gap. Um, so I think there's a Mansion House um, speech the night before on the Monday. So he wants to tell us all about the Mansion House speech on gender and pensions. So that should be quite interesting. So join us next week for Steve Webb. Um, thanks again for joining today. Uh, the video recording will be up later on this afternoon. Uh, and as usual, we pray for peace in the East. Um, um, cannot believe it's now July and we're still saying peace in the East every week. But there we go. Um, but uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you for supporting Playpen. And um, yeah, we'll um, hopefully see you next week. So and Derek, cheers, and Derek. Derek in six months time. And Derek in six months' time. Yeah, that's right. And Derek, if you could stay on for a minute, that'd be great. Just Lovely. with a um, bit of housekeeping at the very end. So thanks all. Cheers, Peter. Cheers, Chris. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, uh, Michael. Really good to see you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you for attending. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Michael. Professor Michael. Good to see you, Michael. So uh, and thank you, Dennis, as well. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, a great, great session, Derek. I mean, as usual in the in the pensions industry, uh, Oh my word! Uh, we could we could have easily done another hour on 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 your on on your session. Um, that's my next appointment. Um, so uh, yeah, great. I mean, there's so much content, so many issues, so many um, areas to cover. Uh, I, you know, we'd love to have you back, Derek. You know, when when you're free uh, and Henry's free, you know, we should do this again. Uh, and we'll probably diarise for a uh, maybe a sort of November December um, mm -hmm. uh, discussion if you, if that's if that's good for you. So really, really, really appreciate it. So which is really good. Um, at this point, yeah, we, we would usually ask you, um, you know, summarize what you felt about today. What was today all about? Uh, and probably what was your most um, interesting question, I guess, uh, and perhaps therefore the biggest challenge. What in, in one minute, what could you what could you say about today and the challenges, you know, that we're facing? Well, the the big question in the private sector is about the provision of pensions generally of whatever kind uh there is not enough pension provision um you know we discussed today uh a lot about where we are today about well-funded db schemes what we can do with them about collective dc um the new things we can do with collective dc um, so very much enjoyed that conversation. Um, I think there remains scope for more conversation um, about exploring more about uh, pension provision generally, uh, how to popularise it, how to mass produce it um, so that people's needs are met. They're yep. not presently being met. Yep. Uh, so the conversation can continue. There's taken strides forward. Definitely it is. Has. It is. Yeah. Yeah. No, really, really, really appreciate your uh, your input there. Um, so, uh, yeah, fantastic. And uh, yeah, um, the industry needs people like uh, you and Henry and myself, maybe to shout about issues and ideas, you know, let's innovate. You know, uh, Guy Opperman, obviously, he's uh, still in, in government, but, uh, you know, a Guy always put a challenge up to say, well, where's the innovation from the industry? So let's keep uh, talking about it and let's keep innovating. Well, in, so. in, 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 in a deed so, you know, that's the, that's the challenge that the Communication Workers Union put to us back in 2017-ish mm. as their negotiating, negotiation with the Royal Mail started. Um, you know, I have attempted to innovate in my own career, but just because I do something with a small employer working out of Manchester doesn't mean that anybody else takes notice. It does mean that when the Communication Workers Union came to talk about Royal Mail, um, I had theoretical research that I'd done before in 97, and I had practical experience of a scheme I modified in 2003. 
so I had a basis for talking about it. Um, but yeah, the the mass of open schemes is maybe something we could talk about more uh, 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 another time. Yeah, that'd not, be great. Yeah, it's not understood. No, no um, not. people talk about closed schemes as being lower risk than open schemes. It's not true. No. Um, there is less risk in running an open scheme. Um, and maybe that's something we can explore another time. Next time. Yeah, yeah we'd you, love to you, see you, that. You, you did mention that. We talked a little bit about it. Maybe we could explain. We did. Yeah. Let's, let's do a session on open schemes at the end of the year. Hopefully we'll yeah. have some more from the pension regulator about their intentions as well. Yeah. I've got to Absolutely. go. Brilliant. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Me too. It's really but, good uh, to see you, Derek. Fantastic, Derek. Really appreciate it. Yeah, that. I really you enjoyed that. Um, thank we'll you for again. offering me the forum. And oh, um, thank yeah. you for both of you guys for doing what you're doing for no, no, promoting fine. debate in the industry. Let's do it. Let's um, keep going. Which is something yep. that Henry's always done for as long as I've known him. There you and, go. Um, and it's a splendid thing to yep, raise challenges, yep. pose questions, yep. and try to push experts out of the group think to some better answers. Better answers. There you go. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Enjoy the rest of your day, Derek. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Henry. Cheers. See Bye. you again soon. Bye.